uh, happy to be here. She played a song, Misty did a song that, you know, I can't, I can't help it, but then to sing before I start delivering the message that we have. So can we turn our hymnals to 537? She, she just played that. I want us to look, we are going to do just the first stanza, 537. It says, he leadeth me, O blessed thought, O worth with heavenly comfort fraught. Whatever I do, wherever I be still, it is God's hands that leads me. Can we sing this song as, to me, just, it's more than the sermon itself. After this, we are ready to go home, if that is fine with you. So let's do the first stanza of that song. Sing it like you mean it. Leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heaven comfort from. Whatever I do, wherever I be, still things go as I leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me by his own hands. He leadeth me. His faithful follower I will be, for by his hands he leadeth me. Amen. Uh, can we turn our Bibles to John 21 as we get into the Word of God? Last week, it's so strange uh, to come back to conservative times. I, I've never done this before. It's always hopping from church to church. But I believe God had a hand. When Pastor called me yesterday, uh, have you sent in your information for the bulletin? I was like, uh, no. Okay. As we heard the story, basically, you are going to speak. So I was contemplating as to, you gave a message last week. and uh, What is it that you want us to do with it, Father? It is you that gives the strength. And the experience we, or the lesson that we had last week, just a recap, with Peter and how he felt that Christ wasn't supposed to watch them. And how, after coming to understand who Christ was and what he was trying to do, requested, can you watch not just my faith, but then wash every part of me. And we also got to know that by Jesus taking off the garment that he had on, was not just because he didn't want to mess himself up, but then taking the form of humanity to be able to do and take our sins upon him because when he gilded himself with a cloth or the towel, neither did he take it out. It stayed on him. So your sin, my sin, is on Christ. So when we look into the mirror, it's ionic to see that the word Messiah was trying to, what is the meaning? You know, how does it fit into my life? And I realize it stands for one thing, that when I look into the mirror, I see the mess in me. But then when I look deeper, I, A, H, I am his. So which becomes that? So when I look into the mirror, yes, in as much as it's me, skinny, dark, whatever description physically describes me, when I look into the mirror with faith, I see Christ, and that is who we are, because when Christ looks down upon us, when he looked down on the cross, it wasn't his son that was on the cross. Christ saw you. He saw your sin. That's why he cried, Father, Father, why have thou forsaken me? Because it was your sin that was upon the cross. So when you feel so down, when you feel the enemy is trying or the realities of life is just trying to knock you out, just look into the mirror and with faith, see Christ who is a Messiah in you, because yes, you are a mess, but then you are his. And Peter did the same. The story of Peter goes on and on to describe how this man, upon this, all these years with the Savior, still did not get to understand who he was. Uh, the lesson is packed with so much lesson. I try to call, to title it, In Love. So I have a question that I want us to use for the basis of our study, how many of us have been in love before? So everybody, how many of us are in love? Uh, be very careful if your, your spouse is next to you. 
I want us to describe what does it take to be in love. This is an open discussion. I want us to really bring it down to our basis because the context of the Bible, many a times, it doesn't get so much to us. But love is a common thing we've all experienced. What does it take to be in love? Give yourself. Give yourself? Okay, I'm going to write these things down. Okay, what else? Commitment. Commitment. Hmm. What does it take to be in love? Selfless. Selfless. What else? Vulnerability. Okay. Being vulnerable. Now the next question is, what do you do to show that you love somebody? Or what have you done? What did you do to win your spouse over, especially the, the gentleman? What did you do to woe your wife, your spouse? Or to the ladies, what did they do that made you, this is a man I'm going to spend the rest of my life with? What do you do to show that you are in love? You do things with them that you not necessarily enjoy doing yourself. You don't enjoy doing, ooh, that is, uh, okay, I see. <laughs> you enjoy it, but you don't enjoy it. Any more? This is an issue of love. What do you do to show your love to your spouse? Be attentive. Put their needs before your own. Put their needs before your own. Put their needs before your own. Okay. Okay, I just had a note from here. We're able to raise 280 for our sister. So we thank everybody that was able to give towards that. So still on the issue of love, the next question is, what hurts? Or can a loved one hurt you? Have you ever been hurt by a loved one? Words. Words? Okay, what else? Lies. Lies? Hmm. Okay. One last one. Betrayal. Betrayal. Okay, we're going to go back to this. At the end. We're going to go back to that. But then I believe the concept of love is what everybody wants to embrace, what everybody's looking out for. So starting off in verse 1, we are going to read through the whole verse of chapter 21. It says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciple at the sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. There... We're together Simon Peter and Thomas and Nathaniel of Canaan in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and the two others of his disciples. And Simon Peter said unto them, I go fishing. They say unto him, Why also go with thee? They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shores by the disciples knew not that. It was Jesus. I want us to break this down. How long had the disciples been with Jesus? 
before his death. A week? More than years. So how come that when Jesus showed himself to them after this, they could not make him up? By the way, just to put it in the context, this was after the resurrection of Christ, when he was getting ready to depart. So if they've spent all these years with Jesus, when he started calling them, right, from Matthew 4, all the way up to this time, they saw the denial of Peter and all this stuff. How come the verse John recorded here that the disciples could not make him up? They did not know that it was Jesus. And can we bring it down to our level? For how long have you been with Jesus? And the question I have for you is, do you know him when he's around? Or you get so busy, tied up with stuff? This was a situation because they had gone as the previous verse said, they have gone for fishing and they caught nothing. So their focus wasn't in to recognize Christ. I don't think it was actually in the picture. They weren't expecting him. Their mindset was on the things that they were supposed to do. They returned back because the king that they were anticipating to get out from him turned out to be a person who got killed. So their ambition and hope in him was totally out of the way. So when he appeared to them after all that he was supposed to do for them was accomplished, yes, so they couldn't make him out. And we now walk with Christ. How different are we with it? Did you experience Jesus Christ this past week? Did you even notice that he was there with you? I don't need answers, but then these are the things that I believe Peter experienced, not just with him, but then so were the case with the other disciples. And going on to verse 5, it says, Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and it shall find. They did so, and now they were not able to draw it out for the multitude of fishes. I was asking, why... Was it relevant that specifically Christ gave the instruction to cast the, have them cast the net on the right side of the ship? And it's, we are blessed, beloved. The word of God is so sweet. God has given us so much secret that Christ is the source of everything that we need in here. I want us to do some few Scripture reading, let's turn to Acts chapter 7, reading from verse 55 to 56. And I pray that he have us see the symbolism of what he did, what he was trying to tell them, what he is trying to tell us now, as more than the disciples of him. Acts 7, 55 through to 57, uh, 56, sorry. And it says, But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up stealthily into the heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on what side of the hand of God? Right. On the right hand side of God. So let's go to Romans 8, 33 to 35. If you are there, you can read it, or else I will take it up uh, over here. Romans 8, 33, and it says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justified. Who is he that condemned? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather that is risen again. Who is even at the, what side of God? At the right hand side of God. So coming back in, we see when we go on to read, we can read from Colossians 3, Hebrews, Colossians 3, 3, Hebrews 12, 2. Over and over and over again, we see Christ interceding on the right-hand side of God. And one thing that I like so much going back into this is that 
the connection is going to come in here. If I'm losing you, kindly try to stay with me. The emphasis is that we are trying to find out what is the symbolic nature of Christ instructing them to cast the net at the right side of the boat. And we saw the end results. When they did that, they had a, a bounty harvest. Let's go to John 14, 6. And it reads, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Moving a page back to John 12, 32. And this was Christ's teaching. And he says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto who? Unto myself. The question is, when Peter and Co. had the encounter with the Holy Spirit, and they prayed, and God came into them, what was the end result when they went out? How many came to Christ? The first sermon that took place after the Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon them. We saw thousands coming to Jesus, coming to understand the gospel. So when we go back to John, when we were reading John 14, 6, it says that if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Is that where Christ is preached, multitude is warned. And that was a symbolism of him because that is what he is doing on the Father's side, and that is what he came to do. So Philip, when he... He came to understand, so were the other apostles when they came to understand who Christ was. And they preached Jesus. Multitude came unto them. So it wasn't just a bumper harvest, but then it was an indication of what I am in here for you. It was the instruction of Christ in there. He could have said, throw the net anywhere. There wouldn't have been the need to emphasize on what side the net was supposed to be cast. But then Christ here is teaching us a lesson. That whilst we cast our net, whatever ministry that he's called us in, whatever calling that our personal lives, personal ministry is in, whilst we cast the net based upon the instruction given to us, which is in Christ Jesus on his right-hand side, interceding, whatever the situation is, there is an end result. And the result is not something shallow that we have, but then it yields to something beyond us. And I believe as a church, if we adhere to the commandment and the will of God and actually preach and live Jesus, we may probably be looking for a bigger space. So what is missing? Is Christ missing? Are we casting the net at the left-hand side or are we are casting the net in ministry on Jesus? That is a question that I ask myself. In my walk with you, how have I done that? And it made me humble myself, and I had to plead with my father, Father, please, I'm sorry for the days that you granted me the opportunity to speak and tell people about your love. It was so much focus on self. And how many people have the time, the 30, the 20 minute span to do your work? Have it, has it drawn people away from you? May God have mercy on us, but then God doesn't condemn. That is what he says. He says, I did not come to condemn. But then I came to seek for those who are lost. So it is impossible that since I'm reading or we are talking as Adventists without referring to that. When we go home, uh, there is this book that I believe a lot of us, we've read that over and over and over again, The Desire of Ages. I'm picking a few from here. Uh, that is from Desire of Ages, page 811. And it reads... While the disciples were doing his work, he would provide for their needs. And Jesus had a purpose in bidding them cast their net on the right side of the ship. On that side, he stood up the shore. That was a side of faith. If they labored in connection with him, his divine power combining with their human effort, they could not fail of success. 
How ionic is this? How much connection is our ministry with Christ? How much connection is our personal life with Christ? Do we see success? Christ is a victorious man. In Jesus is victory. So if in my life I don't see the victory not based upon the material things that I have, but then I'm not experiencing the peace that he's assured in Hebrews. Yes, the struggles are there, but then if I don't see success in my life, the meaning, or maybe probably, I'm not casting the net at where Christ has called me to be. And that is one way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody goes to the Father except by through me. In your day-to-day walk with Christ, do you see him to be the author? Do you see him to be the one to lead you out to make the right decisions for us? Going on uh, to verse 7, Therefore, that the disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that, it was the Lord, he took off his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and then cast himself into the sea. I love this man, Peter. Oh, master, I'm going to be with you, even to the end. I'm going to be with you. But then not long ago, he denied Christ. Not once. And it was so ironic that for a very long time, I've heard the story of Peter making a promise to Jesus, that he was going to be with him. But then do we actually know that the Bible records that all the disciples made the same promise to Jesus Christ, that they were going to be with him? When we, when we go back, let's read the book of Matthew to, to encounter that experience that happened. But then there is something that Peter is doing here that is profound, that I think we can learn something out from that. He was busy doing his work. Last week, we saw Christ taking off his garment. Now we see Peter covering himself. What is your reaction when you come before the throne of grace? What is your reaction when within your closet you pick scriptures to have a talk with the Father? Do you realize your fault? Or it just becomes a daily routine that I have to do and it doesn't matter. For Peter, when he saw, recognized that it was Christ, He didn't see himself fit to present himself as that. So by so doing, he did what was customary right, and that is to cover himself. And not that, he just dived in to the the Messiah. Peter is a good servant, and his life experience or the lesson that he went through before becoming what God hard for him, it's no different from my life experience. And I believe it's not the same for you. Because day in and day out, I've walked out from the sanctuary, I've walked out from the presence of my Father with so much promise. God, I'm going to do this for you. If you do this for me, I'm going to do this. But then the moment I realize I'm back to the basis because I don't really understand who God is. And by so doing, the requests that I put before him are so mere that it belittles the integrity of the Father that I have, and the Father in Jesus Christ. Because he says that he is the creator of the universe, so why go with him? And if he has the plans for me, why present before him petitions that don't have anything to do with that? Because in Ephesians 1, 5 there about, it says that we are created for the glory of God. In our request in our petitions, in our prayer to him. Our requests aim at glorifying God. Do we even pray for that? You know, when we pray, God and I need a job, bless me so that I can take care of my family. Yes, it's a good request. But into what ministry or to what connection has it got to do with the Father? So we keep praying for things. It's not because he can't answer, but then because we don't see the need to make the connection that I need this flower. So that when you send me out and I take it out to the world, others may be attracted and I can tell them this came from the garden of Jesus. That is not our prayer. Instead, we ask for things 
that we think physically is able to sustain us. But then God has more for us to really focus on. We can jump to verse 9. And as soon as then, as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon. Jesus said unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and threw the nets to the land full of great fishes, and a hundred and fifty and three. For all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Verse 12, it says, Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples that therefore asked him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? God is not calling you to come work or do anything for him. Everybody that he called into ministry, provisions were made. The disciples didn't have to go set the fire. By the time they got there, the fire was already, the dinner was already made. And Jesus didn't say, come, have a snack with me. You know, here I've realized in the American culture, when people don't want to spend so much time with you, they invite you for lunch, date. Because lunch, they, they have a one-hour window to get back to the office. But then those that love you, we invite you over for Sabbath afternoon lunch or dinner. There you have the time to talk for long. Dining here, as we go in, we'll see the interaction of Jesus and the disciples coming in here. In that Christ had already made provisions for the things that they needed. They needed food, they needed fish, and all this stuff. With Jesus calling you and I, yes, the things of, 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 of now may make it seem that I need to find a way to make so much things go on right for me. But then what basically Jesus is asking is, come son, come daughter, for I have already made the provisions for you. What it takes is faith. Is that, am I going to walk into Christ embracing this? And I like a quote from E.G. White where he says in the same desire of ages is that the gospel message is not a matter of promoting sin. But then the gospel message seriously condemned sin. In that it eradicated from the sinner's heart. By so doing, you don't have any appetite for that. You don't force yourself to do what is it that you want to do because you are in the presence of God. You are not in a rush to get out. And that you are ready to go into an effective engagement with the Father. At dinner, we talk about from, it starts from work, things in common. We go all the way. And by the time we realize, we've talked about seven, eight different topics. And that is what the presence of God is supposed to be. When we go before him, it's not a matter of rushing, but then it's a matter of intimacy. Are we in love? That is the question. And very soon we see this Christ splashing this in the face of Peter. As we go on, verse 14, uh, 15, sorry. We'll go all the way to 17. So when they had dined, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time. I don't know if Jesus wasn't listening or not. But then you just ask a question, and you are repeating it again. You know, it's just like your spouse. So is this dress good on me? Oh, yes. Are you really sure it's good on me? Oh, yeah, it's good on you. Are you sure? What about the shoulder? Yes, it's good on you. I just said that. And this is basically what, in, my, in Peter's mind, I think, why are you asking this? You just asked this question, and I gave you an answer for that. So why are you asking me again? And not just in between the two of us, but in front of everybody. And verse 17, skipping because we, the same question was repeated in 16. I think at this point, if I was Peter, I would really get frustrated. Because I don't like people asking me questions over and over and over again. Because it points to the fact that, you see that you are not listening, 
or you don't really care, or you just want to push me to the wall. So if I was Peter right now, I would have said, you know what, Christ, enough. But then let's see the response that this apostle gave. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. What was the occupation of Peter? He was a fisherman. So why is Christ calling him to be, to go feed sheep? To go feed sheep. A total contrast in occupation and tax as to what he was able to do. We see so many things happening here in that when Peter was called in, the experience from before his life started to now, this man was a man who had no patience. He was quick to go. But then to those of us that have been around lamb, you know that these animals are really slow. They need a lot of care. They need a lot of attention. So you see in the ministry of Peter that when he went out to preach, to the interactions that he had with those that Christ sent him to, was a matter of comfort. It wasn't a rush. You see the ministry of Peter and Paul, they are two complete different entities that were serving the same Savior. Peter had much attention and nurturing focus to that. So yes, there was a shift in focus and attention, but then that was not the case that we see his old attitude still staying in place. Uh, the question I have for you comes back. At the beginning of the lesson, I made us put down some things that indicated what it takes to really love somebody. What is it that they do to hurt us? And we read from the same Desire of Ages, page 815. The question that Christ had put to Peter was significant. He mentioned only one condition of discipleship and service. Lovest thou me? He said, this is the essential qualification. Though Peter might possess every other, yet without the love of Christ, he could not be a faithful shepherd over the lost flock. Knowledge, benevolence, eloquence, gratitude, and zeal are all aids in a good work, but without the love of Jesus in the heart, the work of the Christian minister is a failure. We just did an act of that for that. The question I have is, do you love Jesus? Do you really do love Jesus? It's not a matter of Peter, but then if you are supposed to change your spouse, the love that you have for your child away and put Jesus in there. Do you love Jesus? The question is, have you given yourself to Jesus? These are the things that we wrote down. That what it means to be in love is that you give yourself out. I like one part. You enjoy the things they do in as much as you do not enjoy it. Do you enjoy the work that God has called you to do? Are you selfless? That's the name, you know, when at first love, I believe at a point in time when you heard the name of the person that you love, it gives you that chill, that good palm. When we started dating, my wife was in Des Moines, and at that time I was here in Ames. I didn't care. I would commute to Des Moines like nobody's business. Because the sight of her brought so much joy to me. Does the name of Jesus give you that chill? Are you really in love with Jesus or the love has faded? Or it has become a common trend that you don't really see the essence of that? Christ didn't ask Peter, love me to condemn him. But then he asked him to reveal his state in him. So we say it's being vulnerable. Are you vulnerable for the ministry of Christ? That is love. I didn't put these things down. We sit at this thing. These are the things that we do to show love. Some go to their stand on special days to do special stuff for them. 
we had a couple coming into our house yesterday because they had a date. The husband was turning a certain years old, getting older. And they drove all the way from Ames to Des Moines. And I could see the preparation that the wife was making because it was the husband's birthday. And I could see this glow around her, how excited she was, looking into the mirror, turning, doing this and doing that. Do you have special time to go on a date with Jesus? Or it has become the norm that we are so occupied with the things that we think is service to him, but then we've totally forgotten about getting intimate with him. What is love without intimacy? Is that a state that we are in? Or it is, how often do you put Jesus first? Is he even ever first? Is he even in our thoughts? Is he even present within? For we know his stand for us. It says that for John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He's shown his love. It's there. And I think I'm on a campaign straight. I'm not campaigning for any presidential candidate. I stated this last week. They are making promises about things that they are going to do. But then on this campaign, Christ is saying of things that provisions are already made. We saw that. He says, come dine with me. Do you love Jesus? That is the question. Or your love has gotten to the point that just as we experience in life, or oh, I don't really love my wife anymore. I can't stand the things that she does. I can't stand the things my husband is doing. Do you ever give up on our children? Do you, have you ever given up on your spouse? If not, then why do you give up on Jesus and take this whole load upon yourself and demean what he's able to do for you and your family? We are unique. There is one message that I believe God is calling us to, and that is to experience his love. It's not just to talk about it but then to experience it. Beloved, if you open our hearts and our minds to him, we really get to know how much it is that we, we are. But then because maybe the definition of love has gotten to the modern day status of love is just a common thing, or you've said that over and over and over again because you don't have any question, connection with that. Or maybe probably your upbringing was so rough that anybody you've been into several relationships that anybody you fall in love with kind of betrays you, your family gave up on you. So when it comes to issue with love, you just shield yourself. You don't want to even go there. It's too much a sensitive topic to talk about it. Or you've lost a loved one physically. They, they are dead. So because of that, you've just shielded yourself to the concept of love. So by so doing, you are not able to link that with the love that Christ has bestowed for you and I. The message is simple. Do you love Jesus? Are you willing to send him? To give yourself up to him? Are you willing to be committed, not just 1% or 99%, but then 100% to him? Are you willing? Do you love Jesus? Then if so, are you willing to be selfless for him? Do you love Jesus? Are you willing to be vulnerable for him? That is it. That is the love that God was requesting of that. But then when we go down to verse 19, he did not stay there. There is one instruction that he gave to Peter. And he says, follow me. He is leading the way. So you don't get bumped into stuff that you are not prepared for. If Jesus is leading the way, the many of the things that we go out during the day or in life we encounter, we may be able to overcome them. Because if he defeated the enemy, he even conquered death, and we are following him, what is it that we are supposed to be afraid of? The question is, do you love him not to even talk about trust him, to follow him? On your day-to-day -day walk, on your personal walk, on my personal walk with him, how much do I trust him? How much am I willing to follow him? Peter change. When you go try to do some studies in the book of Acts, we see when Peter came to the understanding of that, 
when he had gone through all this experience, we see how powerful he became. And that is what he's calling us to be. How many individuals are out there, out of hope, in the things that are going on right now around them? Because everywhere you turn, there is chaos. There is no hope. Even within your immediate life, you don't seem to see past what is before thee. But then the question is, do you love him? Are you in love? That is a question. It's not a matter of are you an Adventist, are you baptized, or how long have you been in church? The question is, are you in love with Jesus, and are you willing to follow him? It goes beyond, I'll follow you for a day. No. No. It is an issue of full commitment and selfless love. This is an opportunity for us. He blessed the Sabbath day. He hallowed it. He sanctified that. Maybe you want to recommit your relationship status with the Father. Maybe it's time you update your Facebook status, not physically but then spiritually, to indicate that you are in a relationship. Maybe it's time to dive back deeper Forget about the pain that you've experienced in the past and just give him a try. I believe it's time as believers we go into covenant with the Father and he's calling us to pray for the rest of the year. Let's as a church, as our mom was saying, one-on-one, -on -one, it's so ionic. I'm scheduled to speak in Ames next week and it's so ionic, the same purpose that you have, the same thing laid on my heart and I was discussing this with Pastor Josh. That's a church. It's time we come together and pray for one another. One another. Let's see. For the rest of this year, from this day to December, let's go into a covenant with our Father to see what he's able to do. We have not, I don't think we've experienced so much. That's why the love is not there because it has become so much of a theory. We don't see the practical aspect of it. But in God is able. God is more than able to do that. So maybe you want to reconnect. You, you really want to update your relationship status with Christ. I think we can do that. We are going to go. I'm not going to pray for you. You know where you stand with God. You know your relationship with him. Uh, Miss Steve, I can have you play a music at the background. There is always an opportunity. The great physician is here. If you feel... Oh, God, I'm not so much committed to you. Personally, spend some time. I can't come here for us to talk without you having an encounter to talk to him. So spend that time. What is it that God, I have to do to show love for you? No. All that he's saying is follow me. Are you willing to go into that commitment with him today? So let's spend some few minutes. I know I've gone past the time, uh, but it's good. To stay, David says, that I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord, for this is where I would dwell and take delight in. Let us spend some few minutes. If it's too much that you need somebody to pray for you, the elders are there. Kindly reach out to them. Let them do that. But until then, this is now. There is no tomorrow. We don't know when it will be. I'm not scaring you. But then there's so much of love that you don't want to miss out. Your first crush when you had that opportunity, you were, I don't want to lose her. So you committed everything into that relationship at the beginning. Are you at that point to do that? Or you are so much in love with him that you want to say thank you for your love. Whichever way that it is, spend some minute in prayer. Let's talk to him on your behalf, on the church behalf. But then it's all about you. Have an intimate commitment and communication with the Father surely, and we will live here.
Our dear Father, we thank you so very much. For Christ. We thank you that just as we are, you are still bidding us to come today. We want to thank you for making this question known to us, for asking us, do we really love you? Father, I don't think we have the answer to that. But then we are willing to give it a try. You don't disappoint. So you heard the voices that came to you. I'm not unworthy to present. I'm unworthy, O God, to just list names. But then as we have this encounter with you, please, you said nobody comes to you and leaves the same. There is one request that if it is according to your will, that I may be putting before thee, or I'm putting before thee, and that is have us experience you, please. Come to our aid, for we really do need you. But Baba, we want to thank you that he never looked down on us, and that your love, your love, your, your awesome love brings joy. What a God that you are. What an awesome God that you are. And we are glad to know that you love us. So we want to say thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for everything you've done. And we give you all the glory. Your will be done in us as you always see fit. This is our humble request. In Jesus' name, amen.